Gene is going to talk about accessible Python education for schoolgirls using avocados, zombies, and Korean. That sounds amazing. <laughs> okay. So okay. Well, good morning, uh, or at least good morning from London. Um, I hope you're having a, a good year of Python. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't be doing this in person. I'm sure we're all sorry, actually. Uh, it's been a pretty stressful couple of months, I'm sure, for everyone. But um, you know, at least we're at least we're here sharing online, and I'm having a a one-sided conversation with you, <laughs> which is quite weird. But um, same for everyone. Um, okay, so. I'm just going to sorry, let me just adjust that I so I see less people. Okay, so accessible Python educate from schools using avocados, zombies, and Korean, um, which in more general terms, oops, make sure I can move my slides, would be about accessible Python education using scientific computing and data science. Uh, so I would also just want to say like in normal, in normal presentation, I'd, I'd want to ask, you know, I'd want to understand yourself as an audience. I'd like to understand, you know, your backgrounds and your interests and, you know, are you educators? Are you uh, school teachers and so on and so forth? But I can't obviously do that. So what I'm going to do, um, I think the way I'm going to try and use this time, um, I'm basically just kind of try and highlight uh, the aspects of this story. Um, the slides are actually meant to be, um, they're actually overly detailed, they're supposed to be standalone. So I'm just going to set this expectation up front just so you understand how I'm going to present. Um, the slides are meant to be standalone, so if you don't listen to talk, you can understand it fully. It's also supposed to compensate for the fact that um, obviously we're using English um, and that's obviously not the most accessible for everyone. So I've written out a lot of the text so that it's easier to follow. Um, so hopefully that's useful. What I'm going to do is jump around in the slides a little bit and just highlight the main points I want to make um, so that we can have a conversation because I think there's a really big opportunity uh, in this kind of space for school children, you know, school girls um, to access uh, scientific computing. Um, I don't have all the answers, you'll find that out, but you know, I, I want to start a discussion and I'd really like to, you know, talk to yourselves and collaborate and get your feedback. So, okay, what I will go into detail is what the point of this talk is. So I'm just going to set the expectation up, up front. Um, so from my observations, at least in the UK, technical education for teenagers seems to focus on these kinds of things. So, you know, this is, I'm a very visual person. I'm probably going to talk through the visuals more than the text. So um, if you ask a child who's doing coding uh, what they're doing, it's going to be very likely one of these kind of options, Raspberry Pi, Arduino, uh, Minecraft, uh, mods, Scratch. Um, really interestingly, uh, I had to make this point. There are actually a lot of uh, computing teachers in UK schools who uh, like uh, VB.net. Yeah, I know it's a blast from the past for a lot of people, but uh, that is the reality. Um, so my point is that when it comes to learning Python, the work that my startup is doing in UK schools is demonstrating that scientific computing and data science uh, education um, can actually be really effective for some teenage students. Um, so basically this talk is going to present a case study. It's going to be um, of a scientific data stack uh, education based uh, in a London girls school. Um, and I'm going to show you the kind of successful learner outcomes that can be delivered by this kind of stuff. So I hope this is familiar to you. Uh, I'm probably not going to, I'm going to have to assume that people sort of understand what, what Jupiter and these kind of uh, technologies are. Um, but we can obviously talk about the breakout if you want more detail. So basically, by the end of this talk, hopefully there's more advocacy for scientific computing and data science as accessible Python education for teenagers. You know, because after all, why should us grown-ups have all the computational fun? Um, and it is a lot of fun. I'm not going to lie. I'm biased. Uh, <laughs> I love data science. Um, but I also want to make the point, so I'm just going to check my Discord, um, that even before the pandemic, um, I actually found scientific computing, I actually found data science uh, actually really helpful for my mental health. So, you know, if I felt uh, really stressed out or really out of control um, as someone who is, you know, higher on the autistic spectrum, um, actually doing coding often helped me, you know, feel more. Uh, it gave me a focus. Um, it made me feel more comfortable. Um, and actually, that's been something I've turned to as well in this pandemic. So, you know, in the UK, uh, we've really not handled this uh, 
COVID very well at all. I'm not going to get political about it, but um, you know, I'm still effectively in lockdown. Um, and you know, although we've been very privileged uh, in the UK in a lot of ways, um, it, it has been it has been tough. Um, and you know, in the same way which data science has helped me cope better in this time, you know, I really want to make sure or, you know, really want to give that opportunity to uh, other young people who maybe also might find data science and scientific computing, you know, something actually really positive for their well-being uh, and not just from a kind of, you know, job tech future um, perspective. So uh, something I have to point out up front. So obviously we're talking about children, you know, there's safeguarding. So the students are not going to be uh, disclosed or identified in any way. So they're going to be anonymous. Um, I will have used visuals mainly from uh, this is one of the uh, meetup communities which um, I founded on my main one uh, uh, but if you kind of want to have a sense of the kind of audience I'll be talking about um, if you are familiar with Harry Potter uh, basically Hermione in the first year of Hogwarts is the right kind of age uh, and sort of gender sorry that will give you a bit of a proxy but you know without the magic stuff because that's um, fun, but not real. Okay, so who am I? I am a tech entrepreneur. Um, I <laughs> have been working for really quite a while now. Um, uh, I think probably the point I want to make is that I don't come from a, a formal education background. Um, so I actually, I'm a social scientist. Um, yes, I know it's, it's kind of weird that I've ended up uh, in Python via R. So this is the first community I founded was uh, called the R Ladies Coding Club, which turned into R Ladies London, which then became a founding member of R Ladies Global. But you know, here we are, here I am at Euro Python for the second time. Um, and so how did I really get into education? So over my career, I really found that um, I had a, uh, I, I seem to have a sort of particular ability to explain, you know, technical content to non-technical people. Um, and then that was something I turned into community outreach, obviously here with R, uh, and then with the AI club. Uh, and then I managed to turn that passion into a full-time job. So I founded an edtech startup with a social mission, um, which is around democratizing opportunities for young people to level up their modern computing literacy. Now that is not a sales pitch. Um, it actually is generally because I need to set the context for the case study which is uh, about a project which my startup uh, was commissioned by a girl's school. Again, uh, I'm not gonna identify the school. It may or may not be represented by this image here, um, <laughs> except for you to, to decide. Uh, but it, uh, the project was around delivering a bootcamp for non-coders to develop uh, Python proficiency. And I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, the project sponsor who I can name, um, just giving me permission. Uh, so this is Madeline Coppa, um, who's actually a, she actually did maths at Cambridge. Um, and so she is the, the person at the time who initiated this uh, really quite unique pioneering project. Um, and we'll talk about the pioneer aspects uh, <laughs> actually through this talk. Um, again, not gonna go through all the details. The key things I wanna pull out here is that it was compulsory. Okay, so this is unlike, you know, uh, the kind of meetups uh, scene that we probably know and love. Uh, where people opt in. Here, these girls did not opt in. Um, they were forced to, <laughs> they were forced to undergo this boot camp. All 120 uh, 11 to 12 year olds um, and five of the teachers. So hopefully that sets some context. Okay, project deliverables. So what was actually delivered? Um, so remember it was a boot camp. I decided, of course, to go with a uh, Python for scientific computing as the uh, the sort of the um, computing application. Um, so uh, I chose this data stack, scientific data stack to introduce the girls to. Um, and of course the Jupyter Notebooks uh, as reference here um, and the structure of the bootcamp. So we said six sessions, so that was in the last slide. So I structured it as basically building blocks uh, with obviously relevant scaffolding because you know, like I just said, non-coders, from non-coders to, to this in six sessions uh, or effectively six hours is obviously a stretch. Um, and actually because it was a stretch, I knew it was going to be challenging. It was 
it was designed to be challenging. That's the kind of person I am. Uh, I like to stretch myself and stretch other people. Um, so the project goals, uh, in terms of uh, the way it was presented to the girls, was basically, you know, I was like, listen, I know it's like you're 11 years old. It's like you you probably don't code if you do code, you know, I mean, fantastic. Um, but I'm going to assume that, you know, you don't have any experience and that's absolutely normal. I didn't code when I was 11. Um, I didn't code when I was 20. Um, so uh, I said, in this boot camp, anywhere you can get up on this um, on this pyramid, I called it, I said, is, you know, is a bonus. So anything you can develop in terms of your computational thinking, critical thinking, creative thinking, fantastic. Uh, I guess one thing to point out here, um, so unlike, I guess, other kinds of uh, educational experiences, um, especially in this kind of school, which was uh, is very academic, you know, I said, don't compare yourself, no comparison, no competition, you know, you're on your own path and you have your own pace. So just focus on that. Uh, okay. I'm going to see whether you can still hear me because I just <laughs> feel like I'm just like talking to myself. Which I quite frankly could be so sorry. That's why I keep checking on the Discord. It's, it's perfect. It's perfect. Okay, cool. Yeah, just let me know. <laughs> um, I don't want to be uh, just babbling. Um, okay, so project outcomes. Um, so there were a small minority uh, of the cohort who had done some uh, coding before, some Python, but of course not scientific computing. Um, so you know, uh, from a quantification quantified from a quantified perspective we had 100 new teenage pythonistas um all girls identified girls and new coding champion teachers uh which was super awesome um but you know i think i'll let the girls uh their sort of testimony <laughs> excuse me testimonials uh do the do the talking for me although i'll i guess i'll read out their testimonials but anyway um so i guess the things to highlight is that you know from a sentiment perspective I mean, they, on the whole, you know, they really enjoyed it. Um, in fact, so much so that one of them said that they love Python, which I'm not going to lie, was really wonderful. And, you know, it's still a really, still a really happy memory for me. Um, but yeah, so, you know, from these kind of responses, you can see they basically, they they just wanted to keep doing it. They wanted to do it at home. They wanted to, in fact, they downloaded Anaconda at home by themselves. Um, they wanted to keep doing it again after the bootcamp was ending. They wanted to do it again next year. They didn't want to go back to normal class. Um, you know, it was just awesome. Okay, this is a point I do want to make. Um, so obviously I didn't know the students. Um, I didn't know their backgrounds. Um, but uh, some of the teachers pointed out to me that there were girls who, you know, in science, for example, they, they were struggling. They weren't historically known for doing particularly well on that subject but actually in the boot camp or you know basically with python um they were actually excelling you know they were sort of you know doing better than you know other their sort of classmates who had done coding before um and you know for me that was just really powerful and again that's just emphasized that you know i feel like science scientific computing and data science could really give young people um the opportunity to discover something that they really enjoy and are good at, you know, um, and I really want to make sure they have those opportunities to discover that. So these awesome outcomes. Uh, so why, really? Um, of course, as a data scientist would, <laughs> would want to know. Um, so I think basically this is what I want to stress is that uh, I'm not saying all experiences, especially not of tech education, I'm not saying they're always you know, that <laughs> negative user experience. Um, although sometimes, you know, I'm not gonna lie, sometimes they are. But uh, in this case, you know, for me, my analysis was very much that, yes, there are negatives, you know, there are things we don't enjoy. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't get a lot of pleasure out of, you know, uh, installation and setup um, and that kind of troubleshooting is not my favorite. I I also know documentation is really important. I like other people's documentation. I am not, <laughs> It's not something which fills me with joy writing my own documentation. Um, so, you know, these would be the kind of negatives. But, um, you know, I think in this experience, I guess uh, I just wanted to draw out that, you know, I tried really, really hard to sort of decrease the negatives or, you know, make the things which might be bad less bad um, and the things which were good to really make them as good as possible uh, and better. Uh, so, 
I kind of drew out sort of six specific features. Um, so I'm just adjusting myself because I'm sitting <laughs> sitting on the floor. Um, so uh, six key features um, that I identified, which kind of had the biggest impact on kind of uh, creating that really good user experience. So uh, I'll go through these in turn, just to highlight the ones in yellow um, are the features which uh, made the user experience less bad than <laughs> the ones in green uh, were the features which uh, made the user experience uh, better. So let's talk about that. Okay, so the most important one was really uh, the choice of open source software. Well, the choice to use open source software as opposed to proprietary. Uh, so uh, if you work in schools, you, you have experience with schools, maybe children, uh, I'm sure you'll be aware that um, the school environment, uh, the IT environment, is dominated by uh, proprietary software. Again, you know, there are reasons, I'm sure. Um, this is just my outsider perspective looking in. Um, but for me, uh, it was really important to, um, to introduce, for scientific computing, to introduce Jupyter and Anaconda um, because of their open source uh, sort of nature. So for me, it really overcame a lot of potential barriers or a lot of barriers which um, are often in place with other technical education experiences, such as the some of the ones which I mentioned at the beginning. But um, you know, I'm not going to cast any shade. Um, uh, so uh, I guess the most important thing is that you know you, there's no cost in terms of procurement cost. Um, that's really important. So um, you know, yes, this this was an independent school, uh, a private school. So this is not a state funded school. So they you know they do have more resources. Um, than you know the average UK school, but you know we have to sort of we, we can't assume that everyone there you know the students especially. Um, so in terms of their ability to use the software outside of school, so um, that stack you know I set up Anaconda and Jupiter or Anaconda, uh, the open source distribution you know that's now installed in that school um, in their lab. So I knew the students could access at school. Of course, I wanted them to also be able to install it at home if they could. Um, and the fact that it was free uh, was obviously uh, a really beneficial aspect. Um, so, you know, it was just basically whether they could or whether they had the time, uh, which also links to the other point I want to make is that I, I really, you know, I mean, I know, I know there's reasons why, but, you know, for me, for children and for something like computing, which is so, you know, such a critical literacy, I, I don't like that there is a trade-off between the quality of software and basically what, you know, a you know, or child's family or, um, you know, legal guardian on behalf of a child can afford. That is something which, uh, you know, I, I feel is is a, is really exclusive, really. So open source software is is really positive for that. Uh, there are other things. So you know, um, Anaconda doesn't need that much um, connectivity. Uh, you know, if you are an adult with basic digital literacy, uh, it's relatively straightforward to install. Um, and at least for these girls, um, I can't say for all teenagers, but you know, uh, after I gave them initial explanation and a bit of practice, you know, no problem, they're autonomous. Uh, they could do it all on their own, which is, you know, again, why it was so easy for them to, uh, to set up at home. Okay, so really quick tip. Uh, the Carnage app, um, so a shout out to uh, developer uh, Nicola Holshu, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, um, who's created this fantastic open source um, app for iOS. So I do use this with another school where the girls have iPads and it works really, really well. And again, open source, amazing. Uh, okay, so prototyping focus is um, a really, for me, was really impactful in terms of creating a better user experience. Um, so again, I'm just going to focus on the visual, really. Basically, uh, I basically got them to do data tricks, or at least at the beginning, um, you know, because remember, first time coders, there was, you know, for some girls, a bit of trepidation, um, you know, it was really sort of unfamiliar. I'm sure there's probably some negative stereotypes as well. And, you know, and to be fair, you know, <laughs> I was making them do, making them learn, uh, you know, a professional level uh, data stack. So I'm not really surprised that it was a bit intimidating, but um, data tricks, so especially using Unicode, 
uh, that really worked really well. So obviously here you can see, you know, this is a good way of, um, so also obviously they'd, they'd got the code point for avocado, uh, the avocado glyph. Um, this is helpful for them learning how to use the print function. Uh, so mathematical operators uh, say, so, you know, I was like, okay, how many avocados should we make? Let's try a hundred, you know, you you have a go. How many would you want to make? Uh, so it turns out we, we discovered that uh, on a sort of standard Windows um, PC, you can make about a thousand, no, about a million avocados before it sort of starts to crash. Uh, but obviously no damage, you know, just restart. Um, so from that kind of data trick, then you can start doing some more fun data tricks. So this works really well as well for young children, uh, young or well, teenagers. Uh, a, a bit of what I'd like to call emoji math. So. So you can sort of see basically how that kind of prototyping as opposed to, you know, kind of long, tedious sort of set exercise, you can see how this, uh, hopefully you'll see this, this is quite fun for children. Um, scope for originality. This is the one I'm just going to also talk about more detailed. Oops. Did someone, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Discord, but that's not a message for me. Uh, scope for originality. Um, so this is quite related to the the last point about prototyping. Um, so basically, so you know, we said it was a boot camp. You know, they had to learn a specific syllabus. You know, which obviously I agreed with the school beforehand. So you know, in terms of these building blocks, that was set. Um, but what I, the way I designed the experience was that, you know, we'd learn a building block, we'd learn some sort of computing information, but then I really encouraged them to think about a kind of a context um, to link it to. So um, in the kind of cognitive uh, psychology uh, domain, this is what's called knowledge transfer. So that's obviously a term for some of you, uh, which has got picked up by uh, deep learning. Um, but the idea is that you, you basically fuse old knowledge with new knowledge. So this is your old knowledge or your sort of existing memories. And this was the new knowledge, the computing. Um, and basically when you relate the two, it becomes uh, well, you learn it more effectively and it also becomes more fun. So let me give you an example. Oh, these are things basically the girls, some of the kind of things that the girls came up with. Uh, so, you know, you can see why that was quite fun in a Python uh, class. So these are two examples. Here we go. We talked about avocados. Here are the zombies and the Korean language. So the building block here is obviously conditional statements. Um, and then the context of the prior knowledge is technical term. Uh, was about zombie apocalypse. We did these, um, these were two things we did together, like as a class. So, you know, I basically set up the uh, the conditional statements and then said, you know, ask them to input, you know, what what kind of statuses did they think, you know, we should have in this, um, this program? And then, you know, what kind of actions should we have? Uh, so that was really fun for them. And then also another example. So this was obviously around um, introducing uh, dictionaries. Uh, or, you know, generally it's the concept of data structures. Um, and then we used Korean, or I chose Korean as a topic because I assumed correctly that girls uh, that age would at least be familiar with K-pop, if not fans of K-pop. In fact, they were fans of K-pop. So they were really delighted to learn how to say hello in Korean, which is Annyeong Haseo. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, so I said, in case you ever meet BTS, which is a really famous K-pop band. So they love that. Um, okay, I'm just gonna whack through these, uh, the last points quite quickly, because I want to kind of finish in the next four minutes so that we can have some sort of questions. Um, so low latency. So the point I want to make here is that um, uh, there are times in technical education, uh, definitely at least at the adult level, where uh, you know, you're trying a tutorial, you're trying something out, um, it's like, it's a lot of effort. Uh, okay, well, that's okay. Rather, rather, regardless of whether it's effort, you know, you do something and you want to find out whether you're right or wrong, okay? Now, you don't really mind too much if it's wrong, but you kind of want to know, right? You don't want to be waiting like an hour and then go, oh, oh, rubbish, you know, there was whatever, it was just literally this one character. You want to find out fast, so you want to fail fast. Um, okay, great if you succeed fast, but the worst is basically uh, in terms of speed, is if things are slow. So something which I think really helped in this bootcamp was that, um, so obviously drawing back to this visual, uh, was that you could uh, debug faster or sooner because you could 
find out um, your error quicker. So this is related to, so you know, that sequence of avocados and tomatoes, uh, which is supposed to be a sequence. So you can see if they basically, um, if they miss out the, the nested parentheses, then you get one avocado and a thousand tomatoes, which is not, <laughs> of course, the intention, um, but you can find it out really quickly. And actually, it's not that bad. You know, you don't mind getting it wrong because, uh, you know, it's kind of fun to try and problem solve, at least in this context, you know, they seem to find it, uh, you know, a kind of, you know, just something to try and figure out what was happening and not, they didn't feel bad about themselves or frustrated. Uh, so hence, less bad user experience. Okay. Um, okay, really quickly, this slide is about uh, the fact that uh, between myself um, and then uh, my colleague, so um, Dare, so Dr. Emma Mabal, um, so we were the Python instructors for this course. Um, it, uh, you know, it was noticed by the teachers that the fact that, you know, Dara and I are not, uh, should we say, uh, the sort of stereotypical uh, oh, homogenous tech identities and or background, um, you know, was noted as relevant by the teachers. So, it, you know, this is a very academic school, but it's also um, an ethnically and culturally diverse school. Um, and so, you know, the teachers noticed that this the fact that these were the people in front of them, you know, doing coding, you know, okay, yes, Dari has a very technical background, uh, you know, he's won awards uh, from the Royal Society for technical things, computational fluid dynamics, which I obviously don't understand because I have an economics background. But, you know, again, that sort of challenges the stereotype that, you know, someone who comes from a social science degree, you know, can end up doing, you know, quite, quite cool stuff, uh, which I won't talk about because this is not really the, uh, talk for it but anyway so that was a positive or less bad user experience that could have been um and then there is the uh the fact that everything was sort of set in as much real world context as possible um so you know we talked about the pop culture and the fun sort of aspects and the originality uh because this school is very academic i also knew that the the girls would care about you know certain universities certain kinds of disciplines um you know certain kinds of organizations and so i basically made as many links as possible with the python that they were learning and these um kinds of real world things which uh definitely helps them or would have made a better user experience okay so uh to summarize the user experience those were sort of six key features obviously there are more um but that sort of drove a better user experience uh which drove the awesome outcomes um that we saw of course that's quite a mouthful really to go through all those different uh <laughs> different aspects i think in the most simple terms the way i describe it is that the project was successful because the girls got to discover how to do new relevant things they couldn't do before and also upgrade things they were currently doing so which i like to call unlock and power up um and not just the students but also the teachers so uh this isn't going to make a lot of sense if someone looks at these slides standalone but this is um uh this was a gift just a, a little thank you from one of the teachers who had really appreciated the uh, bootcamp experience, you know, for the students, but also for herself. Um, so the other thing I want to mention is that this case study, you know, I've said scientific and computing education is effective. Of course, there are different approaches. I like to divide it into direct and indirect. So this case study would have been direct because it was very Python first. So, you know, it's a Python bootcamp. You've got a Python syllabus, you know, yes, then we tie in with your sort of existing familiar knowledge um but you know the python is always the kind of driver however there's a an indirect approach which i use with other schools which can be really effective so the way that works is that you know you've got their interests um you can sort of pick one which is sort of more common should we say or uh more more students share that so let's say art and design um add some python computationalize and in this instance for example you get code art um so like i said uh you know, the girls discover or the students would discover um, how to uh, do new things. So maybe they've never done fractals before, fractal art like this, or maybe they already do fractal art, um, but actually maybe uh, doing it in Python uh, gives them, you know, more power, more functionality, um, and basically it sort of makes something they're doing already uh, better. So I guess this is the point really about meeting kids where they are, uh, not where you are, or not necessarily where you want them to be, but where they are today. So in conclusion, um, I hope I've convinced you uh, to at least consider 
that fighting for scientific computing day in science isn't just for grown-ups. Uh, you know, it can really spark joy for teenagers and adults. So why not let teenagers have a go? Um, and that was all that I had uh, planned. So thank you so much for listening to my talk. And please get in touch or, you know, hopefully we'll have questions. Thank you. Send you love and your message to Chin in, in our Discord channels. So I have a few questions for you. Awesome. Um, Hannah is asking, do you have any advice for how to get involved with voluntary volunteering to teach coding skills to girls? Well, I mean, <laughs> of course, you can always, uh, I mean, we would always love volunteers, uh, for example. So uh, my EdTech is, uh, yeah, effectively is run as a social enterprise. So, uh, you know, we, we do charge for projects um, where sort of possible, but, you know, we do do pro bono work as well. So if you're a volunteer, uh, we would definitely like to find a way of, of working with you. But um, in terms of other ways, uh, schoolgirls, um, I think, you know, there are, there are initiatives uh, to outreach Python, obviously to, you know, uh, to everyone. Um, I think for me, the scientific computing is really the aspect where, uh, you know, there isn't necessarily that kind of opportunity um, or access and availability. So I, I would have to say, I mean, I obviously, I couldn't say for sure, but I, I'm fairly certain I haven't seen really anyone else doing what we're doing. Um, or at least not with schools or kind of on a more accessible basis. I know there, there, is, a, uh, there is a market leader in the UK who uh, I, I believe they do do something similar, but they charge a lot, let's just put it that way. Um, and it is outside of school uh, and in certain areas. So um, I guess, yeah, sorry. The, the quick answer really is uh, please get in touch, you know, uh, in the breakout room maybe. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you can. So there is a... You, you can continue the discussion in the <clears throat> in the Discord channel for this track, but there is also a channel in particular for this talk. The name of the channel is Talk School School Gears. Uh, sorry, uh, I think I it, it's okay. I think I saw it earlier. Uh, I think it's Python for School Girls. Um, I, I have it here. It's Python for School Girls. Yeah, sorry. And um, so it's Talk Python for School Girls. And then one more question. Lil is saying, great talk. Um, how did you find the structure, say, in terms of technician supports and your co-workers that were involved in the project? What was their, their prayer back, uh, background? Um, there, sorry, was that... Um, so what the was the background of, uh, of your co-workers? And how oh. you find infrastructure, right? Like uh, if you have like, support, technical support, that kind of things. Oh, um, <laughs> my co-workers, we are a small team. Uh, it is, uh, uh, how do I find, was it how do I find my co-workers or their background? Uh, well, my background, the, my co-workers tend to have a, um, a kind of more general data science background. Uh, and then I kind of tend to use my experience, uh, <laughs> my experience in industry, basically hacking, you know, IT solutions or, you know, just basically making things work. So uh, it tends to be me. So in fact, it is me coordinating with the school IT departments, which is painful. So I'm sure people are aware of that. Um, but I hope that answered the question. But yeah, please, we'll, we'll talk about in the breakout room if that didn't provide the information. OK, so we have time for one more question. So if anyone wants to ask the question live, you can click the button to raise your hand, and I can enable the microphone. Uh, so last call. Okay, so I think we're done. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. <laughs>